Good morning, everybody. Welcome. Oh, oh man. Oh, okay. Anyway. Uh, good morning, everybody. And uh, welcome to this week's live. There we go. Uh, sorry, I just spilled coffee all on my jeans. That's what happens when you, you know, first thing in the morning, I guess. Anyway, welcome to this week's live. Nice to see you. We had a um, really big week in the group. Uh, you know, it's great. And, you, know, every, you know, when we get, there's a scene in the Facebook group where whenever you get like 50 people, you can like welcome them, you know? And so um, I can track like how big we're getting just by um, how many times I, I, I welcome people in. And it's pretty incredible to see this just in the like, influx that, that is so big. I, I, um, it's just, it's just really amazing. So I just wanted to show you guys this thing here for the last like 28 days or whatever. Like, look at that. Just nice little chunk, nice chunk. So anyway, um, I really appreciate it. So getting into this week's live, I just wanted to touch base with that and say hi. Uh, we're going to touch into some hacks for the CCBO, uh, CCC, the cost cap CBO system. We're also going to touch into some old school, uh, homework on um, retargeting pieces um, and, and trying to make that really work. And also uh, try to answer some any of your questions for the week. And um, I have some questions for you all. So um, that's gonna be uh, you know part of the whole thing today. So it, it, it's, uh, it should be fun. I've been, it's great to see more and more people uh, take into the eBooks. It's been fun. I've been getting people messaging like, oh, we keep talking about this stuff, where can I get it? Everything's in the Patreon, so make sure you take a look at it. There's there's links inside the group, and I'll put it again inside this live of how to get to the Patreon. Um, on there, there's a bunch of eBooks and, and great subject stuff. Also, I've been trying to share every single day more case studies from stuff that I've worked on and other things from Build to Break, the Facebook Disruptor Summit. Um, so hopefully really try and provide a lot of value. want to make this group as, you know, it, it, do as much with it as, as we can. So with all that being said, homework for this week on retargeting. So every week we have homework. And if you do the homework, you can get a half off the Patreon, half off the Slack, or any of the eBooks that you want for free. And you can also do this week's homework or any week's homework to get that. And you can also stack things. So if you want half off the Patreon, you can uh, do this week's homework. If you want half off the Slack, you can do another week's homework. And then you just keep stacking the things up. Um, mind you, we're on, I think, ebook 10 or 11 at this point. 11, yeah. So we're going to continue to work through things. And I'm working on the follow-up to the CC CBO, the cost cap CBO. And if you have any suggestions on any things that you'd like to cover, we're going to get to that. As well as the number one thing that I want to cover this week is a question that people kept asking and I really wanted to address, which is all these people randomly getting their accounts shut down. So we're going to cover that. So anyway, let's get into the homework. We'll count the uh, account shutdown, and then we'll get into the cost cap CPU piece. Anyway, let me get through this coffee. Hopefully, I don't spill it on myself again. Mm. All right. So first thing, I want to address the retargeting. So our homework for this week. Now, for those of you uh, that don't know, and so we'll try to address this for everybody, retargeting is – Taking an audience that you get mainly through pixel data when you place a Facebook pixel on your site or somewhere else and trying to use that to sell them something more or to sell them something because they didn't purchase. In the world of trying to sell products to consumers, this might be add to carts or you know people just have been to your site but didn't buy anything. There's also an element inside of retargeting which we call retention sometimes where somebody bought something and you want to show them something else. So today's retargeting is going to be more focused on people that may have events or a physical space or might have um, you know, a bit of not just selling things online. Because I, you know, I, if I just focus on those folks, um, you miss some of the theory around everything. And um, you know, a lot of times I see people talking about theory based on stuff and the regurgitating things and 
you know, if you don't understand how the entire ecosystem works, then you're going to be less effective at trying to make any one piece of it work. And that's one of the things that I really, really have been enjoying about this group is the questions that I'm getting asked are more and more with people that understand the theory and they want to execute on it properly. You know, when I first started this piece, um, I was just getting people asking, well, here's what somebody says, how do I make it work? And a lot of the times it was, well, what they were saying was wrong and then trying to make it work is going to be wrong. And so that's why we have this big undermine the guru section. And, you know, we had a group member uh, do a talk on stage, which is great. And I, I know this group member, I don't want to call them out, but um, so big ups to them. Um, but they were doing it with, you know, what I know about this person because I've worked with them before and no slight or anything, but there's some people that really understand how to execute what people say. And then there's some people that understand how to create something. And it's the big difference between being a line cook and being a chef. So what I'm going to try to do is help you all be more of a chef by giving you situations and problems that aren't necessarily directly just the same thing all of the time. It's not how do you make this thing better? It's how do you solve a problem to make something new, right? So with that being said, one of the things that I want to do today for your homework is for you to, I'm trying to think of how to word this right. So anyway, for you to create audiences that will allow you to promote something other than just selling a product. So that can be one of three things primarily. Number one is retargeting audiences where you have an ad set based around a specific location. So for instance, this might be everybody, say for instance, you have a physical store, right? So um, one of the people that we work with here is Pilates Punks, right? And you've seen her in the group sometimes too. Um, she's got a physical location. Now, she sells things. She sells classes, right? She sells seashells by the seashore. Anyway, um, she sells classes. But if she wants to promote her Instagram account or wants to get people to an event, um, she could take the audiences and try to do something with it. So what we're looking at here is how do you take so that's, that's one piece, is the geolocation. The second piece of it is taking something that isn't a conversion-based audience to try to get somebody to do something in the real world, right? And so this is not somebody that made a purchase for something. It might be somebody that has shown an interest in something. So instead of taking your buyers in a specific location, let it be your Instagram engagers because you might have a really big Instagram account. More people are going to engage with your Instagram account than with your Facebook account. Um, more interested people because your Facebook account engagers are going to tend to be people that are liking and commenting and sharing your ads. If you don't have a lot of ads or if you have a very strong social media presence or if you have a physical location where people are tagging you all the time, or say you're in a band, or you're pushing a movie, or you're doing some real world things, so you're doing teaching. Those types of people tend to have a lot of engagement on their Facebook, but primarily on their Instagram account. So you can take those Instagram engagers and again, geolocate them towards a specific event or location, unless it's an online thing, and then you can say, here's all the people that have engaged with me, let me use that for another purpose. The last thing that we have is for folks that have mobile apps or lead gen. And again, these are people, these are, we are retargeting them with something, or sometimes this is more called remarketing. What we want to do here is take that audience. It's a C, generally a CRM list. So it's app installs or leads that you get, emails, stuff like that. And we want to take them and we want to focus them, that audience, towards a specific event. So how do we do all of this stuff? And I've kind of repeated some of it, so it kind of makes sense. But what we'd like to do, and this can also work 
by the way, one of the ways that this impacts people that are selling things directly to folks is the geolocation layering on this retargeting is you might want to say, well, I'm doing retargeting events all over the world, or I'm doing advertising events all over the world. Say you're selling boots or umbrellas or whatever. Um, you can take that audience and focus it towards specific places because maybe you have ads that talk about things being, in, or you have a specific landing page that says something in the Australian dollar or in the English pound or in the American dollar or in the Euro. So you sending the same exact ad, sending people to the same exact landing page doesn't make sense. So again, this is how we kind of take this very small application of how does, you know, one small studio use their Instagram engagers to retarget people to come to a live event it's the same way that somebody running an ad on Tapjoy to 20 different countries can retarget their traffic to send people to specific landing pages based on the countries that they're in. So how do we do all of this? What is the homework? It is very simple. And all you have to do to execute the homework is just send me a screenshot of you doing it. So this should be really easy. And the, you know, the vast majority of you are already doing this. Um, but now I want you to just take a look at it and use it as part of a theory, <clears throat> a theory on how to execute something. So I want you to take a retargeting audience and geolocate it for a specific reason. That's all you have to do. So, and this can be Instagram engager audiences where you're targeting people within you know 20 miles of an address, or it could be um, people that have installed your application that live in a specific state, right? Or a country, or it could be people that have bought or added to cart a product that live in a specific region. So this could be very much of, you know, if you have a store location, add, type in that address plus five miles, everybody that's in, engaged my Instagram account. Or if you, again, I know I'm repeating myself, but just to kind of put this back in the place, um, if you're doing something that is, you know, say it's about some specific event where somebody's doing teaching in multiple areas, put in, uh, you know, that state and then say everybody that has, you know, viewed videos that's in that state. And then also another way of doing it is saying everybody that's abandoned cart in England and there's going to the specific site. There's somebody, everybody that's landed the cart, add the cart in Germany different currencies, different purposes. So anyway, that's the homework. All you have to do is just send a screenshot of the ad set build. It just says this custom audience, this location. And when you do that, just say, it would be great when you, when you do, take that screenshot, direct message it to me on Facebook. Um, and then I'll make sure that you get a free ebook, half price link to the Patreon or a half price link to the Slack channel. Um, which the Slack has been blowing up a lot lately about people trying this cost cap CBO and uh, really trying to make it work and really trying to work through it. And everybody's got different problems and that's great because now we're able to really fine tune it and make sure that it's effective for people. We also just um, I shot a video, a screenshot for one somebody in there about how to make the uh, Scrum Doc. So there's, um, I think he said that we can publish it. So this today, hopefully, um, I'm going to share the video on how to make, take straight Facebook data and make a Scrum Doc from it so that you can track all of your performance. For leaders that don't know, the Scrum Doc is a piece of, is, is a self-made reporting tool that we have, um, that, that we, this group has. Um, that I've been using to track performance across Google, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, uh, Twitter, uh, Tapjoy, any media that you have, um, and report all of your performance in a single place so that you can see the contribution to every campaign, contribution to every part of the funnel in a very simple way that takes 15 minutes, 20 minutes a day tops to put all the information together. And as and the result of it is you're able to get a very clear and visual snapshot in a way that no one particular platform can provide, and in a way that holds every platform accountable to the lowest common denominator, which the majority of us have been preaching this as long as possible, is the one-day click um, attribution. 
So you know that this means that if somebody clicked on this ad, they made, what behavior did they take within 24 hours? And the reason that's important is because we don't want 28-day attribution. We don't want seven-day attribution. You can't make a decision on something that takes a month long to, to develop and mature. Um, so that's going to be really helpful, not shopping in the Slack channel. Uh, I, I can't share that in the Patreon or in the group because it's private data information. Um, but that's the type of thing that we talk about a lot inside the Slack. And if you want to know this higher level stuff, if you want to be uh, um, willing or, or not afraid to share some of it out in the open and be really getting the hands-on details, that's really what it's for. Um, as well as also a lot of chatter about um, you know the value that other people are bringing. Plus, um, hopefully, uh, if you have very specific questions, I can answer those very specific questions to help your business, whether you're doing $500 a month in spend or $10,000 a day. Um, so it's extraordinarily, um, I try to provide as much value there as possible. And a lot of the time and attention has been going into making that as effective as we can. So anyway, there's that piece. So homework again, we'll get you any of the eBooks for free or half off the Patreon or half off the Slack. Simple enough. And if you want to know more about those things, just Comment in here or write, uh, you know, if, even if you want to just say, I want to get into this thing, what is it? Write that as a post inside the Facebook page and I'll comment and I'll approve it and we'll comment and we'll get it going. So there we go. Um, next piece. And this is a big one that I've seen from a lot of people and I've personally been helping people get through it a lot. So I wanted to address it this week because. Um, you know, when people ask questions, some of the times the questions get a lot of attention and this one got more likes and comments than anything and of the whole week. So it was from somebody named uh, Abdullah Muhammad Shirazi. And he said, a bunch of people are getting a, ad accounts banned for nothing. Parenthesis, uh, they say they haven't broken any policy. Not just ad accounts, whole business managers are getting banned. Sometimes appeals are successful, but then it gets banned again. The scariest part is the personal profile being restricted from advertising. It would be, I would really appreciate it if you could make an ebook or live on the best practices to avoid getting banned and what to do once banned, how to create proper backup plans of profiles getting restricted from advertising, and how not to get your whole business shut down overnight. This would be such an amazing topic. We need peace of mind while running ads. So you asked, I'm going to deliver. Here we go. So first part, this is not uncommon. This is happening a lot, and it's not just on Facebook. It's happening on a lot of platforms. I've been seeing it happen across Google, and I've been seeing it happen across Twitter, and, and you know, for some reason, Pinterest doesn't seem to give a shit, neither does Tapjoy, so that's great. We should definitely try to expand. Um, but let's get into why accounts are being banned. So the number one reason that accounts are being banned is because they're tied to some um, violating behavior. So what type of violating behavior are there? Let me break down the, the four most common violating behaviors. Number one is ads are getting uh, ads are being disapproved for being, you know, showing too much skin or promoting some illegal product or something along those lines, right? Your ads are constantly being disapproved for a specific reason. If your ads are getting constantly disapproved, by the way, I, I don't know what's going on with the chat here, but I can't see shit. So uh, I hope you guys aren't asked. I don't know. Facebook's screwing up right here. So if you're asking questions, I can't see it. But uh, I'll, I'll try to catch back up. Um, maybe I can find it on my. Um, maybe I can find it in the live while watching it. Oh, there are comments here. Let's see. Uh, hey, yo, that. Look, look. Oh, look at that. Oh man. Stop. Stop. Ah. Okay. All right. So let me see here. Uh, yeah, Abdullah actually just now commented. That would be great for all of us. Can you enlighten us on the proper backups? Awesome. Um, so there we go. <laughs> 
I don't know why I can't see the chat, but now I got it on the, I'm watching myself on the live feed here so I can see the questions. This is weird inception. Okay, so number one, a lot of accounts are getting banned, right? The number one reason that this happens, or not number one reason, but reason number one, you know, the first reason that these are things are happening is a lot of the ads are getting banned, and they can be banned for many, many reasons. One of the reasons that, uh, that uh, ads could get banned are illegal content or promoting illegal products. Now, the ads themselves might not be violating, but um, Facebook will look at what they call beyond the click they look at any page that an ad can lead to based around three clicks from the ad. So this goes into reason number two, is the beyond the click is that your site, while the initial ad might be fine, you know, maybe it's just a picture of this Roku remote or some, you know, guitar picks, right? But you click on that page and then there may be a link in that page, just something that's violating. And it might not even be the product is violating, but there might even be just a word. So I see this in CBD stuff where they'll say, you know, it might be like mountain oil, right? And you click on it and then there's a link to something else that says about the product. And then about the product says all of these things that are violating. Um, so you might even just say hemp, right? You can't say hemp. Um, I've worked with somebody that they did wrote H plus sign MP totally got away with it. It was completely fine. <clears throat> but so reason number two that things are happening is it's not just where your ad goes to, but it is where somebody can land within three clicks. So the click number one is the ad, but where can they go from there? So if somebody can click on your ad, that's click one. And then they can click to the home page, for instance, right? Or some product collection or something about me, right? And on there, totally fine. But then there's another link there that takes into something that'll violate, something you're not promoting with Facebook ads, but something that is violating. So I can see this again pretty commonly and they'll use the CBD example. One of the reasons that CBD accounts are getting banned all the time. The actual product, totally fine. Topical CBD stuff, which is now allowed, right? Um, so that's running. And then they go to the home page, okay? And then on the home page, it lists products that are completely in violation of Facebook practices. Because they can get there within three clicks, the ads are getting shut down. And because the ads are getting shut down, Facebook is then looking into the site. And when Facebook can crawl the site, just like Google does or anything else, they can see that you can navigate from Facebook to a violating page within three clicks. Then the business manager will take a hit because you are violating practices. Facebook looks at this as you trying to hack the system and will ban your account, your ad account. And if you have multiple ad accounts that are getting banned for multiple reasons, then the business manager can be shut down. And then if you are in violation of the terms and conditions of Facebook, the personal ad, the personal user account of Facebook will get shut down. So those are the top two. Those are number one and number two. Number three thing of why business managers are getting shut down or why ad accounts are getting shut down is because of audience development. One of the things that happens when you're making audiences inside of Facebook is you can do it basically three ways. One, you put in like interest groups and behaviors or whatever else. Number two, you have pixel data, right? Where Facebook is capturing user journey information because, you know, they landed on this page, they landed on this page, you're doing it. Number three is you upload information. Now, when you upload information, you check a box that says, I got this from the user, people are okay with this, blah, 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 right? Now, Facebook takes your word for it immediately, just like, you know, when you say, back in the day, you used to click on a site and say, yes, I'm over 18, I wanna look at this. Um, Facebook will look at that the same way. They'll take your word for it. But if you get violations, 
Facebook will ultimately audit everything that comes through, but there are millions and millions of people. The way that this is prioritized is based on level of violation. So if you get a bunch of ads disapproved, and maybe your site has some things that aren't necessarily really legal, and then you're uploading these audiences of these giant user groups that are in some way potentially violating, Facebook will look at the formatting of it, look at the sources, look at everything. And so this is where people that use tools that are in violation of Facebook's terms and conditions when they upload stuff and they lie, saying, well, yeah, people said I could use this stuff. Um, they'll get ad accounts banned. And then because Facebook is really trying to crack down on illegal activity, um, your ad account will get banned, your business manager account will get banned, your personal user won't be able to use Facebook anymore because you're in terms, you're in violation of the terms and conditions of the platform. So where does this happen a lot? You know, there are a lot of like guru types and ad agencies and all these types of people that are trying to sort of, you know, these are great hacks for Facebook and people use them. And as a result, they're getting shut down. So I, I've seen this stuff all the time where people are, you know, buying email lists from other folks or they're uploading, you know, they, they've scraped um, email addresses or user identification from Facebook groups, um, which is one of the examples that happened this week. Um, or they're getting information from some place that violates the law in the in the area. So one of the things potentially there is, you know, in America we have the FTC, the Federal Trade Commission. If you are getting information from somebody in a way that violates the law, then um, Facebook will look down upon that basically um, and shut you down so that Facebook isn't legally liable for violating the law. So this is one of the reasons that we push so hard for using messengers and chatbots and all of these places so that somebody can willingly, through the terms and conditions that they sign up for Facebook, give you their information so that you don't get shut down. If you want to get all of this information from people, you know, if you want to say you want to scrape an audience inside of a Facebook group, there are ways to do it that aren't violating the terms and conditions of Facebook. So going back, um, oh, let's give one more example here. Uh, going back to the you know four things that people happening. The last thing that really causes issues is when the sites or the products that you're pushing create violations, or sometimes it's just the actual um, uh, uh, assets that you're using inside of your creative. So, for instance. And this happens a lot, especially the drop shippers. That's the number one thing I think that's shutting down the majority of drop shippers. And I talked with reps about it, and, and everybody's kind of on board that this is kind of what's happening. Is um, it, say you're a drop shipper and you're selling, I don't know, this donut pillow, right? It smells like chocolate. And then there's the pink side, smells like sugar. Um, cool pillow, got it at freaking Target or whatever, right? Say you're selling that pillow, right? You've got this pillow, okay? Let's use the chocolate side. Oh, fuck it, let's use this side. All right, so you're selling this pillow. You're doing this from Alibaba, right? And you've got your drop shipping all set up and all sorts of stuff, okay? Now, you're probably one of a 100, a 1,000 people selling this product on Facebook. Now, when you are all selling the same exact product, a lot of times what happens is people don't actually buy the product on, when they're selling stuff on Alibaba. They're just saying, you know, well, here's the product and I'm going to sell it. What happens is when you don't buy the product, you don't have it, you don't own the product, is that you have to use pictures and videos that you get off the internet to sell the product. So say there is one really standard picture from the Alibaba listing and you use that standard picture from the Alibaba listing to sell this product. What happens then? If you and a thousand other people are using the exact same picture to sell this product on Alibaba, and say 300 of those people violate the terms and conditions of Facebook, maybe they violate it in India or they violate it in Germany, but it's actually okay what you're doing in Australia or America, 
but you got a thousand people selling the product, 300 people violate the terms and conditions by you know uploading data that they don't don't have legal access to, or they're landing on pages that are also selling products that are illegal. They're violating one of those first three things that we talked about. Facebook will say, okay, well here's a creative asset that's tied to violations of Facebook. Who else is using this asset? Facebook scans all of the information. If you notice, when you upload an image into Facebook, it's not the exact same image that's, that you uploaded. They format it because they scan it, because they know everything in the image. They also know everything inside of the video. Um, they, they use you know, face recognition, they're using tracking, they understand the context of the media that you're using. So, if you are using the same asset, that everybody else is using, and everybody else using that asset is violating the terms and conditions, their ad accounts getting shut down will mean that your ad account gets shut down. So this is about quality of advertising. So those are the four primary things. So going back, how do we fix these issues so that we're not exposed to them? Number one, if you are getting a lot of ads disapproved, Understand why they're getting disapproved. Don't keep appealing them to get them approved. Start taking ownership of the process and saying, I'm the one making all of these ads get disapproved. What is it that I can do to avoid that happening? And try to get more and more ads approved. When you get constant disapprovals, you are raising red flags to Facebook saying that I'm an advertiser that is trying to break the rules. Number two. Yeah, Abdullah, it's absolutely scary getting punished for other people's crimes. You have to think about it from Facebook's perspective. You know, it's um, they're trying to find a systematic way of solving, of, of reducing exposure to legal risk as a company, right? So number two is the site. Take a look at your site. Understand what Facebook's terms and conditions are. You know, like what you can promote and what you can't promote. And if there's anything on your site that you're not allowed to promote, don't make it readily available for people to find after clicking on a Facebook ad. And there are really easy ways of doing this. There's, there's honestly, I, I've done this with several people, but we call this like a walled garden approach where if you make a second, if you make a, you know, say you have your main site where homepage and then product collection and then inside the product collection is all your individual products that you're selling. And product A, B, and C are completely legal, but product D is highly illegal. Make it so that when somebody clicks from Facebook, and you can do this through DTMs, you can do this in any way that you want, but make it so that when somebody clicks from Facebook, product D isn't visible. And you can do this very easily saying, okay, well somebody comes to my site from a Facebook ad. There's UTM equals Facebook, something like that. That's the simplest way of doing it. When they go there, you just mask product D, not visible. That means that when somebody clicks on your ad, there's no way if they click from a Facebook ad that they can see content or products that are violating Facebook's terms and conditions. Then your site becomes compliant. Another way of doing that is by saying, say you're selling illegal things or you're trying to game the system a little bit, you can also make an alternate site, just duplicating your website with a different URL and on that site is only the, is where all your Facebook ads go and on that site is only legal things. So. Say you're selling 50 products or five products, right? Let's say it's four products, A, B, C, and D. And D is the violating thing over here, right? So say you make another version of the site. So it's, you know, donut.com and then it's donut-fb.com. Donut-fb.com doesn't have the, um, you know, CBD products for sale. And what that means is basically that you're still going to get all your traffic selling everything else, but Facebook itself doesn't see you trying to violate their terms and conditions with Facebook ads. It's a very simple fix, um, and this is something that I've used repeatedly and has gotten around to everything. That is one of the primary things is Facebook's just saying, hey, look, just don't make it, don't put illegal things available, right? And this, was, this makes sense. You know, in the real world, what is this an example of? In the real world, if you're in America, if you're you're a store that sells cigarettes or liquor, right? It's not necessarily on the in the aisle. 
right? It's not next to the milk and the honey and the fucking bread, right? So what, what do they do? They put it behind the counter, for instance. Now, if you're a normal kid going through there and buying candy or whatever, you might not even see it, right? So much like in your site, you can't get to it. They're putting up a block, right? Or they're basically saying in Facebook's world, you can't click in an app, you can't walk into the store, and based on other clicks or other aisles that you're going down, you can't put this product in your cart. You can't see this product. It only happens after the checkout. Um, and so Facebook, there's no way that you walking into the store can purchase that product on your own. And that's why, you know, like if you go to a 7-Eleven here in America, you can go through any of the aisles, but if you want to buy cigarettes, you have to go up to the counter and ask for it. This is a Facebook's way of doing that and the way you construct your site, very much making it something beyond the third click, where the first click is clicking on the ad. So that's how you fix that problem, and that will fundamentally help the vast majority of people. Number three is the audiences. The only way of getting around this is by not cheating the system. Um, don't violate the terms and conditions. If you are using data sources, or if you are using you know, hacks from gurus that say, scrape this audience, upload into Facebook, do all this stuff. If you are using that data to power your ads, you will eventually get shut down. If you are not obeying the law from Facebook on how you're creating your audiences, your account will get banned. Eventually your ad account, then your business manager, and then your personal page. And if other ads, if other accounts are attached to your business manager, they can shut you down as well. And I've seen this happen time and time again. So that is one of the primary reasons. If you are uploading information specifically into Facebook for you to use as a custom audience, understand that if you don't have legal protection and, un and, and release from those individuals to say that you can use that information, odds are your entire account will get shut down because you're violating the terms and conditions of privacy laws internationally. You're basically, you're being a terrible person and Facebook doesn't want to be legally liable for you being a shitty person. Um, and you know, a lot of these gurus and a lot of these assholes suggest you being a shitty person uh, because they're not good at their jobs. If you want to be good at your job, how do you avoid this? Make customer journeys that make sense. Have people opt into things. The honest truth is those audiences, the people you use to upload things, are very short-sighted, they're very limited in their ability, and they're not very effective. Um, people's glory stories about all these audiences are generally done outside of a one-day post-click without giving scale, with giving correction, with giving attribution to everything else that's going on. They're just like everybody else that says, well, I'm getting 7X on Facebook, I'm getting 28X on Facebook. You're not getting that number on a one-day post-click. You're not able to scale into it. It's not stable and it's not the foundation of your business. Um, you're lying. And so those people are lying to you and they're saying one of the reasons that we're doing is some really fun, smart thing we figured out of how to violate the terms and conditions to help you, um, then, uh, you know, you're going to be in trouble. So Abdul asked, okay, um, great question, great question. How does Facebook find out whether that custom audience is legally collected or not? It could just be my list of purchasers. Well, there's a couple ways. Um, number one, let me just answer this question completely differently. Number one, for you to upload your list of purchasers, the best way of doing that is by putting a Facebook pixel on your purchase event. That way, you can't possibly violate the terms and conditions because Facebook pixel is providing the data. So the entire basis of your question is invalid from there forward. You don't even need to worry about it anymore but say that's not a possibility or not something you're set up for or, or whatever else. You uploading data. Um, the way that Facebook really understands a lot of that has to do with a couple of ways. One is formatting. Um, really easily, Facebook understands the partners that Facebook allows all kind of format data in a similar way. When you upload that information, um, for instance, if you're uploading Amazon buyer information into Facebook, 
which is a violation in terms of conditions, and Amazon will then sue Facebook for billions and billions of dollars because you're an asshole. Um, that data is formatted very particularly. What the types of what the types of um, information that you're uploading as well. When you have user information, you tend to have a lot of information. So you've got first name, last name, email address, phone number, direct mailing address, a bunch of stuff. When you're uploading very high quality information, it means you're also uploading a lot of it. You don't have just one or two or three data points on somebody, you have a lot of data points. When you're uploading illegally found information, like you're scraping a Facebook group, you've got first name, last name, email. <coughs> now, some people only give you first name, last name, and email. Generally, when somebody electronically opts into allowing you to use their information, you get fuck ton more than that. If you don't have more than first name, last name, email, first name, last name, phone number, um, odds are you're violating the terms and conditions. 90% of the time. Uh, the people, and maybe not you, but the people that are uploading that very low quality information that's probably collected illegally, the vast majority of people doing that are people breaking the law. So because 99 out of 100 people that do that are breaking the law with it, Facebook says, well, we're a business that doesn't want to spend billions of dollars on legal fees just to protect less than 1% of our advertisers. We're just going to say, hey, if you are behaving the same way as everybody breaking the law, we're just going to shut you down because we don't want to deal with it. So if you're a liability to the platform, the platform will restrict your ability to do business. Very simple. Um, and then and the other way that Facebook understands that this information isn't legal is you're probably not the only one that has it. Um, and this is really common. Again, if other people are violating Facebook's terms and conditions, um, if, 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 if other people are violating terms and conditions and you have the same information as that person, then you're gonna get in trouble. Which goes to, Mike, we're getting to this exactly right now, um, which is the content, right? Remember we were talking about this piece, right? You're selling this thing on Alibaba, right? You're selling this thing on Alibaba and there's a thousand other people selling this pillow that for some reason still smells like sugar. I don't know how they did that. Um, this is like months old, right? This side smells like chocolate. How do they do that? Say you're the guy selling this product on Alibaba, right? And you've got your picture that you've got from the Alibaba listing because you didn't actually buy this product. So you don't have your own content for this product. So you're promoting with the same content as everybody else. And maybe 30% of those people or 80% of those people are violating the terms and conditions because they don't understand the law, or maybe the law in their area is different than the law in your area. Maybe they're in Pakistan and you're in Germany, or you know something like that. What they're doing in their home country might be legal, but it's illegal for you in your country. So in America, the laws are very tight on what you're allowed to do. Because there's a very robust you know, infrastructure, capitalist economy, all sorts of stuff like that. Um, so the laws in America of what you're so allowed to do are much tighter than someplace else. So if somebody in Pakistan or in India or in Germany or Australia is a place that you can do kind of a lot of things, if they're promoting this product in a way that is viable, um, but in America breaks the law and then a bunch of hundreds of people in America are selling this product and they're breaking the law, because you have the same asset, because you have the same creative element, or because you're going to the same landing page, or because you're using the same audience, because something that you're doing is the same, in this case it's data, landing page, or content, is the same as somebody else that is that is violating the terms and conditions. And you know, honestly, maybe the picture that you're using from the Alibaba listing is a copyrighted picture. Maybe you're not even allowed to use that picture. Right? So because of those reasons, anybody breaking the law raises the risk for everybody else that's sharing that same thing. This goes to being a quality advertiser. If you are a high quality advertiser, you don't have to deal with this problem. Say you wanna sell this product and everybody else is getting banned. Buy it. Get the product. 
Have it sent to your house or your business. Take pictures with it. Take videos with it. Make your own content regarding this product, and then you're not beholden to the rules of everybody else doing it. So how do you sell the product that a 1,000 people are getting banned? You buy it. <laughs> it comes to your house. You take pictures and video. You upload it. You use only Facebook data to get people. So you're retargeting folks that have landed on your page because of the pixel. You use, an app, you use the bot maybe on your landing page, or you're promoting content, and you're doing comment to opt in so that somebody understands that when they engage with you legally inside the Facebook ecosystem, they're giving you their name, their phone number, their address, their email, everything. And then you port that information into Facebook and use it as a custom audience to target them legally at scale and high volume with no risk to the platform. Now you're able to sell something that every other jackass is gonna get banned for life for doing. And that's what happens. As it's not just your accounts getting shut down. You personally could be banned from Facebook for life because they're smart enough to know who the fuck you are. So that's a lot of it. The number one way of avoiding getting your ad account banned is by being a quality advertiser. Understand that if you want to make money selling products, you can't do the same thing as everybody else. If you've ever been to a flea market or one of these big open air places, you might see the same product being sold at 20 different, 20 different booths versus somebody else goes in and maybe renames the product or packages it differently, puts a little bit of effort to be something other than essentially disrespectful to the customer. That person will win almost all the time. So if you want to win, if you want to avoid risk for this stuff, then the number one way of doing it is by being a quality advertiser. Make yourself not a liability, but an asset to Facebook, and Facebook won't ban you for life from Facebook, and your company won't go out of business overnight because you're using Facebook. Now, mind you, if your company goes out of business overnight because your Facebook gets banned, then the problem is on you because you should expand off of just using Facebook. This is what we talk about getting onto TapJoy, getting into Google Ads, going onto Pinterest, going onto all these other platforms. And if you want to understand how to use those platforms, not to shake my own whatever, but I have an ebook inside of the Patreon. It's, it's called like the Ecom Brand Builder ebook. And it talks about how to use other platforms to really build it. Facebook should be the thing that you spend money on after you get a successful business. It should not be the thing that you rely on for your business because it's very expensive to advertise on Facebook. You know, I'm working with some stuff where on Facebook, maybe your CPM is $20. There are ways to get CPMs of $1.50, of $3, not on Facebook. You want really cheap traffic? You want to be exposed to a shit ton of people with a conversion objective? Go on Snapchat or go on Google Display Network, or go on you know, some programmatic media buying. There's a lot of options to reach people for very, very cheap. Say you wanna reach people and get them to watch a video and you want that video to carry your branding messaging, advertise on YouTube. It's very, very cheap. You can advertise on Facebook as well, but the point is, Facebook shouldn't be the end all be all of your business. And if you violate the terms and conditions of Facebook, you're likely to be out of business. And if you want to understand how to do those things, check out the ebook. Like go into there and you can go into the Slack channel and I'll walk you through setting up your Pinterest campaigns, your Snapchat campaigns, your Google Display Network campaigns, your YouTube campaigns. A really strong advertiser doesn't rely on one thing. You don't have a store, you probably don't have a store with any one product. You probably have multiple products. Just like you have multiple products, you should be advertising on multiple platforms. It's really that simple. But if you don't follow those rules, then you're probably gonna be in trouble. Abdullah says, I mostly do local business lead gen. Awesome. Then Abdullah, I, I think uh, you should ask a question back in the group because you spawned this whole thing. It was a fantastic conversation, really great questions. I would love for you to either A, join the Slack channel and talk with all of us about what you're doing so that we can help you out on a very detailed level, or, or at least B, ask more great questions inside of Facebook because what you did today spawned an answer for half an hour that's probably gonna help 
hundreds or thousands of people from getting their entire account shut down and being banned from Facebook for life and ending their entire journey on doing all this stuff. So what I would love is ask more specific questions about that Facebook, uh, the, the business lead gen stuff that you're doing, and we'll start answering more of those pieces because there's a bunch of ways of solving that problem. And while this is a Facebook ads room, Facebook ads are part of an ecosystem. And if you don't understand the whole ecosystem, you're gonna be in trouble. So anyway, hopefully that's really helpful. I wanted to get into one more thing today, um, which was getting into the uh, cost cap CBO system and some of the best practice hacks for this. And these come from not only myself, but also a lot of the chatter that's happening inside of the Slack rooms. <coughs> so about a month ago, or three weeks ago, we dropped a new ebook around this cost cap CBO, which is number one way of running cost cap campaigns, number one, running, number one way of running CBO campaigns, and honestly, just about every single Facebook campaign that I have set up is built in this system, and it has been dramatically helpful for me to do one of the two things you're supposed to do, either A, increase volume while maintaining cost, or B, get more efficiency while maintaining uh, volume. So spend more money at the same price, or spend the same amount of money but get cheaper results. This is a system that will do that. And I've been using it across you know, multiple advertisers. We've shared it inside the Slack. People are trying it across many different systems. It's working about 80, 90% of the time for almost everybody. But sometimes it doesn't work. So what do we have to do? We have to hack it. And how do we hack it? Well, we've got five different ways here to help you hack it. And it's in the ebook because I tried this stuff out first. And I wanted to share it with you so we have to find best practices. And then these are ways to tweak those best practices because maybe um, – What's good for me isn't what's good for you. So here are things that you can do to beat this system in a different way depending on what your problems are. So problem number one that people are having with the cost cap CBO and the hack is not getting a lot of spend. So there are several ways of getting around this. The best way is, or one of the first hacks is to Say your ad set to a seven day click, one day view, instead of just a one day click. Um, now what this does is it gives Facebook more data. It says, okay, I know that somebody that buys the product in one day is what you're measuring, because you're still measuring on a one day click. Your scrum doc is still set up to that, but if you optimize your ad sets inside of the campaign to look longer, then it allows Facebook to look at customer journeys that take longer so that it can see Maybe you get 10 conversions in a day, but over a week you get 70. Now Facebook is able to look at a data set that is seven times bigger. And if you include the one day view metric, maybe it goes from 10 today to 100. So when you do that over a week, you can go from 70 pieces to 700 pieces. Mm -hmm. it, it gets very, very big. So Facebook is able to look at conversion data at a much bigger scale, which means its data set for understanding who a good impression is, is much, much larger. And if it understands that, then it can spend more money. And also because you're allowing Facebook to optimize to say, well, somebody's gonna see my ad on a Friday night and they're gonna buy on a Sunday, I'm okay with that. Then it's gonna start to spend more money against it. Now, you're still measuring success on a one day click. You're making your decisions based on what happens in one day and all of your automation and everything, but you're allowing Facebook to see more data, which allows it to increase its spend. Now, that 80% of those conversions are gonna happen on a one day click anyway. Um, so don't really worry about it, but if 100% of your traffic is on a one day click and you can spend $10 a day, versus 80% of your traffic is on a one day click, but you can spend $100 a day, and your cost is the same, you should try to spend $100 instead of 10. So that's, you know, that's one way of hacking. So this will give Facebook more data to evaluate. The automated rules will still protect your bottom line because the automated rules are still saying, hey, if this thing doesn't happen on a one day click or if this thing doesn't happen in the way that I want it to be done, then um, we're gonna stop the ad. So you're still training Facebook to say, you're allowed to look at more data, but if you don't produce the results today, 
then you are, I'm going to shut that ad down for a while until your result comes back in. So maybe, you know, you're saying my target cost is 20 bucks and you're just letting Facebook look at a seven day click, one day view window for the $20 and Facebook says, well, I know if I serve this ad, well, when I serve this ad, I'm going to get the, that $20 CPA within three days. Because somebody's going to click here, maybe get 10, maybe get 10 people to buy, and over the course of three days, that overall cost per conversion or cost per acquisition or cost per sale is going to come down to that price. Because it takes time after somebody clicks to make a purchase. But if you tell Facebook, hey, I understand that you're looking at this long window, but if you don't make the sale soon, then I'm going to shut you down today then Facebook will start to try to serve ads that are gonna get sales today, even though it's looking at a long window, so it understands who the people are that are buying over the week, but it's still trying to get results now. Um, so now it's a bit complex, but when you put the system in, it, it will, when you enact it, it'll kind of all come together. Um, and you still need to measure performance against one day click, as always, and measure automation against one day click, as always. And one of the big things is, the Facebook number, your cost per sale, come will mature. That number will get lower during the day. Theoretically, if you don't, if you stop spending money today, it will get more efficient over the period of the day. Because, so say you set your goal at twenty dollars and it spends a hundred bucks and you get two sales right away. If somebody saw your ad in the morning and maybe they buy at lunch, which is something that happens a lot, or you see an ad at night and then you buy in the morning, whatever. But um, one day click means anybody that makes a purchase within 24 hours of clicking on that ad. So say you spend $100 by 10 a.m. and you make two sales right away. Your cost for, your CPA, your cost per acquisition, your cost per sale, your cost per purchase is $50. But then you get somebody to buy, they buy at, in the afternoon. Right? So they click on that ad and then, okay, they make a purchase in the afternoon. Now your CPA goes from 50 bucks to 30. Then say uh, you get another two purchases in, you know, later in the afternoon by three o'clock. Now your cost goes from $50 down to, well, five sales remain down to 20 bucks. And you can say, hey, look, Facebook, if the sale ever goes below $25, turn the ad back on. Then Facebook is saying, okay, well, I spent $100 in the morning, and then at 3 o'clock in the afternoon, because more people purchased off those initial clicks, I can turn the ad back on. That's the way the automation works, and that will protect your bottom line, even though Facebook is looking at conversion windows that are much longer, or attribution windows that are much longer, so that it can increase spend, because it understands more, and has more data to understand what a potential buyer looks like. So that's hack number one. And I know some of this is high level, but not everybody in this room is first day, so hopefully some of this helps you all that have been doing this for years and years and years. Number two, um, you can also set ad sets that have different bids inside of the campaign. So we're saying in Costco CBO that you want to have a broad audience, a lookalike 1% and a lookalike 10%. Now maybe what you do is say your bid is a $20 target CPA, well you can set you can have those running, but I have one version of all three of those ad sets running at a $20 bid. But I have another three running at a $15 bid, and another three running at a $25. What will happen is Facebook will immediately try to spend wherever it can, and you set the automated rules to the same things across the entire place, but you're going to start, because you have more ad sets, you've got more you know, horses or dogs or whatever in the race, Facebook will then understand, okay, um, these are more places for me to spend, and you're going to clear some of the sales at the $15, and you're going to get some of the sales at the $25, but you're ultimately going to blend still to try to get some delivery. And what happens is because you have more ad sets live, there's more places for you to spend, and because you have different bids, you're basically inside of the ecosystem competing with other people instead of having one person bid in the auction raising, you've got three people. So you're more likely to spend that way. Another hack to it, and this is more for people that are seeing, especially in creative testing, one idea just run away with things, is spend, set spend minimums. Say, I want to spend at least this much. 
any chat set. And what that'll do is if you're getting a lot of delivery, that will prevent any one thing from completely getting all of it because you're gonna try to spend more evenly through all of them. And this is something we've done in bucket-based CBOs, both all around the spend minimums, but inside of cost cap, um, the cost cap CBO, it allows you to have a little bit of control. Now, Facebook, say you set your minute, so you set, um, um, you've got five, you, you've got five creative concepts, right? And you set a CBO budget of $100, and you set a minimum of 10 for each one. That should be $50 allocated, and then the other 50 Facebook can spend however it wants. Now, if Facebook can't spend that minimum in one place, it will reallocate the money somewhere else. Um, so it won't limit your total upside, but it will provide some structure, and you're t giving Facebook more signals to tell it what you want it to do. I generally use the spend limits when doing creative testing. I found that in scaling, I don't use it as much because I want, the, the whole thing is based around giving Facebook as much freedom as possible, so I will let it do that. Another hack is creating an always off animate, uh, automated rule and applying it to losing campaigns or losing ads or ad sets. Uh, don't really use it for ad sets, but you're losing campaigns or ads. Um, and what this means is what I was finding was when I was making these automated rules, anytime I launched a new campaign or I launched new ads or I wanted to turn an ad off, the automated rules were turning them, were either not applying because it was new so I had to rebuild them or they were turning at, if I turn an ad off because it was a loser and I wanted to stay off, I have to adjust all my rules again to account for that one piece. So instead, I've made an always off rule that just says, okay, well, this ad is a loser. And I say, that goes to the always off. So if Facebook ever sees that ad live, it's going to turn it off right away, which means inside of creative testing or after you've done creative testing and you push ads from your creative testing piece to your scaling piece and maybe they work, maybe they don't, um, if something fails for whatever reason, you can just apply it to the always off and then it'll be outside your ecosystem. You'll no longer spend on it, but you don't have to delete the ad. You don't have to rewrite your automated rules. You, it, it's way less work to just say, exclude this one from everything from now on. And an always off rule will do that. Last thing. Um, if your budget is too low to apply to the rules, move to an event higher in the funnel. And this is the number one thing that I see people are like, well, you know, my product is $50. I can't spend $1,000 a day to do this. Well, if your product is 50 bucks or 20 bucks or whatever, your add to cart might be $5 or $10. So set the automated rules to that lower cost item. So, you know, the automated rules inside of cost cap CBO are set to, multi um, to multiples of your target CPA. So you're saying instead of, well, my target sale price is 50 bucks, I know that one out of five people that, or one out of 10 people that add to cart, that adds to cart buys. Okay, well, if it's one out of 10 people that add to cart buy, and my target cost to make a sale is 50 bucks, I'm gonna set my add to cart target to $5. And then I can start to set all of my automated rules to say, not that a purchase is 50 bucks, but my add to cart is five. So now if I'm gonna set an automated rule to 10 times, or to five times my target CPA, that automated rule gets enacted at 25 bucks spent, not at $250 spent. So that way you can apply these rules at scale, no matter what your spend level is. Now, maybe it's an even a higher level. You, you can only afford to do it at the click because you're spending 100 bucks a day. Okay, that's something that you can do because you just set it to a different level. Now, the further away you get from the purchase event, um, generally the lower quality the traffic is, but look, what you want more than anything is to be spending and to be learning and to scaling up your business. So if you have to start with low quality stuff, well, then you start with low quality stuff. It's better to be good enough than to not go start because you weren't perfect. And if you're running a business, you don't, you shouldn't run a business that needs to make money day one. 
You have to make an investment into the platform and an investment into your resources to understand, to, to figure things out and to understand how to make it work and to do the testing so that you can see what works and what doesn't. You can't say, well, I can spend a hundred dollars a day for like three days. And if it don't make any, if I'm not profitable, I have to shut my business down. Um, which is something I see a lot, right? People are like, well, this is a waste of money. Facebook doesn't work. Well, you didn't do any creative testing. You didn't let Facebook learn from your pixel events what worked best. You didn't let automation train Facebook on to really understand what your business objectives were. You weren't able to hit some sense of stability. You weren't able to let Facebook even get, leave the learning phase from the ad sets that you had. And you then weren't able to understand what the right ads were, the right products were, the right customer journey was, or what the right retargeting was, or bundles or upsells. You didn't get into anything. You just basically said, well, I threw a couple hundred dollars at it and I didn't make money right away. So it's a waste of my time. And that will fundamentally tank your business if you're not willing to make investments. You have to invest and you have to be willing to lose in order to win. I lose at least half the time. Sometimes 80% of the time I make mistakes and I'm, let Facebook fail because I know that if it fails enough, it's going to make good decisions. You have to let it fail enough to learn just like anything else, whether it's a dog, a baby, anything. You have to make enough mistakes to understand what success looks like. And if you don't let Facebook do that, then you're going to fail as a business. So that's the tips for this week. Uh, really appreciate it. Um, everybody being here, um, and I, you know, would love to help out everybody that can. So please ask more questions. Be as engaged as possible. Share this group with your friends. The number one way that you can say thank you is by inviting a friend. And if you want to get more out of this group, I highly suggest getting into the Patreon. And if you want to get way more out of it, get into the Slack because that's where the real shit is really happening. So anyway, with that being said. Have a great weekend. See you guys next week. Bye.